It's safe to say that 1978's Halloween, directed by master filmmaker John Carpenter, is my all-time favorite slasher film. In fact, it is in my top five favorite films ever made. Being the first real, honest, Samhain horror movie I ever saw, it made me into the horror-loving freak I am today. Horror has always enticed me, which is why I was such a big fan of children's horror series like Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark as a kid. But movies like Halloween, I couldn't watch them. I was basically told that these movies would make me too scared to function. So the thought of actually watching a movie like Halloween, just the idea of watching it scared me. I was afraid of being afraid, but I couldn't resist. I remember it like it was only a few days ago. 14-year-old Cameron, sitting on his bed with a bucket of Halloween candy, snacking nervously as AMC's Fear Fest launched into their 8 p.m. showing of Halloween. My heart was racing. Palm sweaty, mom spaghetti. As the opening credits started, afraid of nothing but fear itself. And then something happened. I realized I wasn't actually afraid. The simple image of the jack-o'-lantern slowly panning toward me, paired with John Carpenter's infamous score, made me feel right at home. It was as if I was fulfilling some kind of prophecy. Cameron Chaney was watching his first real horror film. And 15 years later, here we are. If Goosebumps introduced me to horror, the 1978's Halloween showed me that I could have a place in the genre myself. It paved the way to me writing my own Halloween-themed horror book, Autumn Crow, and led me to start Library Macabre in the first place. This little independent film was a major stepping stone in my life, and I'm glad I decided to watch it. I've seen Halloween and its sequels numerous times since, but there has always been a blind spot for me. The novelizations. The first four films of the franchise have their own novelizations, penned by various authors, as does the latest installment, Halloween 2018. Somehow, I hadn't read any of them. And I still have some catching up to do, but I recently read the novelization of Carpenter's original film, and I want to talk about it, and a couple of other Michael Myers-themed books, right after this. Published in October 1979, Halloween by Curtis Richards takes Carpenter's original script and extends it, giving us a story rich in All Hallows folklore and combining it with elements from the script of 1981's Halloween 2. As we discover in Halloween 2, and spoiler alert for those who still haven't seen the movie 40 years later, Michael Myers, boogeyman, stalker, slasher extraordinaire, turns out to be Laurie Strode's brother explaining why he is targeting her on Halloween in the first place. This isn't a thing in the original 1978 movie at all. Michael kills at random, and there is no disclosed lineage between he and our final girl. But they had to come up with some kind of twist for the sequel, and making the two of them brother and sister just made sense. Even though Halloween 2 lacks originality in many aspects, the sibling angle is one I have always liked. And it was cool reading a version of Halloween that works this twist into the narrative. In the novelization of Halloween, Lori already knows she is adopted. But of course, she doesn't realize her brother Michael has escaped Smith Grove Mental Hospital until it is too late. While this may not be true to John Carpenter's original vision, this gives Halloween fans something a little different. We also get a lot more backstory on Michael himself. The opening of the book is much longer than the film, taking us back hundreds of years to Northern Ireland during the Druid Festival of the Dead. It is here that we learn about an ancient curse that damns an evil soul to walk the earth forevermore. Of course, this is the same evil that latches on to a young Michael Myers and forces him to kill Judith, his teenage sister. This unspeakable act robs Michael of his innocence altogether, allowing the evil to invade Michael's mind completely. It is really very tragic, the idea of an evil presence latching itself onto the most vulnerable thing it can find, a child, in order to walk the earth again. If you think about it, Michael actually died the night his sister did, 
leaving his body an empty vessel. After the murder of Judith Myers, Michael is sent to Smith Grove, where we get plenty of scenes of him growing up in the asylum. And yeah, if you've seen the film, the rest of the book is pretty much the same from there, except of course for the knowledge that Michael is Laurie's brother. Overall, I really enjoyed the novelization. Curtis Richards' writing is crisp and crunchy with autumnal atmosphere. I could hear the leaves rustling in the wind and feel the Midwestern chill on my skin. The author introduced some cool concepts to the story, making it his own while never losing the essence of Carpenter's original story. The only thing I want to point out is that the sex scenes in the book are far more graphic than the film. And while the film portrayed its women very respectably, the book focuses a lot more on their bodies. Uh, for instance, a female character will walk jiggly instead of walking <laughs> if you catch my drift. So just heed my warning before going in. I liked Laurie Strode in the book though. I think that she fought against Michael Myers even harder than she did in the movie, so that was a lot of fun. I recommend the book as a whole, especially if you like the movie. If you're a fan of the movie, then this book is an absolute must. Now, the novelization is very hard to get a hold of. It's rare, it's out of print, it can go for quite a lot online. Like I've seen copies go for over $100. It's crazy. You don't have to spend that much. There is an amazing YouTube page called the 80s Slasher Librarian. And this guy buys old copies of these out of print books and will read them on YouTube. He does his own audiobook productions. He has narrations for all of the original Halloween novelizations, all of the Friday the 13th novelizations, basically anything you can think of, it's on there. It's completely free and all of the ad revenue that he does get for these videos goes to the appropriate places. So don't feel like you're breaking the law by listening to these audiobooks it's completely legal. I highly recommend visiting his page and listening to all of the out-of-print books that you haven't been able to listen to before. It's a real treat. It was also here that I listened to all three of the 90s YA Halloween books. Uh, wait a second. There's a 90s YA Halloween series? Yes. Yes, there is. Let's go back to October 1997, shall we? Author Kelly Reno, writing as Kelly O'Rourke, was hired by Berkeley to write a series of three Halloween novels for teens, each book following different teenage characters in Haddonfield, Illinois. The first book, The Scream Factory, was published on October 1, 1997, and follows 17-year-old Lori. No, this is not the same Lori from the original movie. In fact, Jamie Lee Curtis's Lori is never once mentioned in The Scream Factory, and neither is Dr. Loomis or any of the other characters from the franchise, minus the boogeyman himself, Michael Myers. The book does, however, reference Michael's killing spree in the 70s, which has turned the silent killer into a bit of an urban legend among the teens of Haddonfield High. When Lori and her friend volunteer to throw a Halloween bash at the town hall, they start getting threatening messages from an unknown stalker. Thinking these are just pranks from one of their enemies at school, the girls proceed to decorate for the party, but then the bodies begin to pile up and the girls start to wonder, has Michael Myers returned to Haddonfield? The Old Myers Place is the second book in the trilogy and follows Mary White, who has just moved to Haddonfield and she is now living in the home of Michael Myers. In fact, her bedroom is the same bedroom that belonged to Judith Myers back in the 60s when she was murdered by her brother. This book references the events of the previous book, but other than that, that's really all the connection it has other than Michael Myers being back once again to kill, kill, kill. The Madhouse is the third and final book and follows a group of teenagers from Haddonfield High who are filming a documentary about the ghosts of Smith Grove Mental Hospital. But are the ghosts really what they should fear? Or is Michael Myers himself still wandering the halls? He is. I'm gonna get right to the point. These books are trash. <laughs> they are plainly written, the characters are wooden, the plots are paper thin, and the dialogue would not be Deborah Hill approved. But this is what I loved about these YA Halloween books. They are so unapologetically of their time and I wouldn't have had it any other way. I adored the cheesy dialogue and the catty characters and the cringy, mysterious guys. And more than anything, I really enjoyed the death scenes, of which there are plenty. O'Rourke really heaps on the blood and gore, something that really surprised me for a 90s YA horror book. Fear Street and Point Horror rarely got this violent. Overall, the 90s YA Halloween trilogy was a 
blast and I highly recommend it for die-hard Halloween fans as well as just fans of 90s YA horror. On another note, if you're not a fan of movie novelizations or what is basically Halloween fan fiction and you want just the retrospective on the Halloween franchise, look no further than Taking Shape, Developing Halloween from Script to Screen by Dustin McNeil and Travis Mullins. This book is incredible. It is the ultimate text on the Halloween franchise, going over Michael Myers' beginnings all the way to his return to the big screen in 2018. We have exclusive interviews by screenwriters and directors, as well as interviews with some of the authors from the novelizations. We also have facts that even the most diehard of Halloween fans will find surprising. For instance, I had no idea that David Lynch was originally optioned to direct Halloween 2. It completely bypassed me. I had never heard of that before. Maybe you have. Maybe this isn't news to anybody else, but to me, I hadn't heard of it before, and I think it would have been really interesting to see that, to say the least. There was also a lot of information in Taking Shape that has been discussed countless times before in various documentaries over the years, but in the end, I just really appreciated how complete this book felt. Now, I listened to the audiobook of Taking Shape that was sent to me by Encyclopocalypse Publications in exchange for an honest review, and I have to say it didn't even really feel like an audiobook. It really felt more like I was listening to a podcast, especially with all of the interviews that are included. A book like this really benefits from the audiobook format, and I highly encourage all of you to go and give it a listen. And if you're not into audiobooks, I feel like the actual physical book is going to be worth your time as well. It was just fantastic. Very well researched, just a very good time overall. And I have got to get my hands on Taking Shape 2, the Lost Halloween sequels. I have to have it. That sounds even more interesting than the first book. Taking Shape, it, it brushed on the, uh, the lost Halloween sequels that were never made, but I, I have to know more. So if you are a Michael Myers fan, I think you owe it to yourself to read any of these books, and I am definitely looking forward to checking out Halloween 2 and 3 and 4, all of those novelizations. And I do hear that when Halloween Kills comes out, they're going to release a novelization of that as well, which is very exciting. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to comment, rate, subscribe. I work really hard on all of my videos, but this one took quite a bit of time. So I just would really appreciate it if you could share this on social media or with your friends. It would just really mean a lot to me. So thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next episode of Library Macabre. Later creeps.